Today on Dead Dodge Garage, let's build a 440. To get a project like this done, one must have an ethos, um, procedures in place. You know, a way of doing things. I'm gonna tell you mine. Doesn't mean it's the right one, it just is what it is. All the parts get laid out in the order they go into the engine. Makes a nice little map. When assembling an engine, cleanliness is extremely important. Not just to the components, of course we're gonna clean them, maybe twice. But your tools, everything that goes in or touches this engine needs to be clean. When I was building engines professionally all the time, I had a special set of clean tools just for doing it. This is them. Um, I had to clean them. Cleanliness is extremely important, so is checking everything. This block and crank were machined and cleaned and prepared by my favorite local machine shop, Johnson Machine. And they're really good at stuff. Assembled in this pile here, just about everything I need to build this engine, except a camshaft. More on that later. Here are the machinist notes for the crankshaft. Rods and mains are both 10 undersized. Here we have a set of matching undersized bearings. Important note on cleaning things. Do not use red rags to do this. You'll end up with an oil pickup half full of red fuzz. Ask how I know. I use these blue shop towels. They leave a little bit of lint behind, so you do have to be very careful with them. Some other tools we're gonna need. Obviously a ring compressor, fueler gauges, and a good torque wrench. Standard socket set, of course. Speed wrench, essential tool, and a hammer. Time to move on to more cleaning. Get to clean all the saddles, all the caps, and the crank before I can lay it in. Oh, do note, uh, the machine shop also already installed the cam bearings for me, so I won't be showing you that one today. Main bearings, they have a top and a bottom, unless your set is special and they're all the same. These ones conveniently, whoop, yeah, there you go, are labeled. Upper, meaning in the block, and lower, meaning in the cap. If they weren't labeled, we'd know which are which anyway because only the ones that go in the block have an oiling hole. Thanks to the notch on the side, this can only go in one way. Carefully align it and it should snap into place like so. As you're installing these, check them. This one actually has a tiny nick there. If you can catch your fingernail on it, it's gonna need some attention, possibly some light sanding. This main bearing is special. It has the thrust surfaces built into it. In a Mopar, this is main bearing number three. In some other engines, they're in the back or wherever. Either way, same installation process. <sighs> Hang on. Easy. Yeah. Pro tip, don't drop your bearing shells. Even better pro tip, before you insert your crankshaft, install the top half of your rear main seal. If you don't, you're gonna have a bad time. The two halves of the rear main seal are the same. Make sure you install them with the lip facing the oil, meaning inside of the engine. Install them square, just like that. Some people think it's a good idea to install these seals cockeyed slightly. I don't. Put it just like this and add tiny little dabs of silicone here, where the seal parts. Should be good enough. There are all kinds of different options for, you know, assembly lubricants. I like regular old engine oil. And this engine will get pre-lubricated before it ever runs, so I'm fine with that. Let's install a crankshaft. Ah. <clears throat> carefully, very carefully. Take your time. Notice, I usually use mechanics gloves, but when I'm building engines, I don't. For one thing, they just get stuck in things, and for another, well, it's kind of important to be able to feel stuff. Hopefully your main caps are numbered, and you know which one is which. On this engine, main cap number one is not numbered, but all the other ones are, so it's fine. If you have any questions about orientation, align that notch with that notch. Proper cap installation. Gently set it on, start both main bolts, and delicately tap it with a hammer to make sure it seats. It actually is numbered, but because it's a Chrysler casting, it sucks. The hammer tap is key. I think I told this story in the small block video, but 
I once received a 360 engine that a friend had rebuilt, and he told me when he tightened the main bolts down all the way, it didn't turn anymore. All I did to fix that was loosen all the caps, give them a little tap, and torque the bolts again. Good to go. No power tools here. Couple important steps here before torquing these down. First, make sure they're snug. Next, we're gonna make sure the thrust bearing is set correctly with a screwdriver and a hammer. Carefully insert your flathead between a part of the block and the crank and tap it lightly in one direction and in the other direction. We'll leave it there while we do our first torque run. The correct torque spec for the main bolts, 85 foot-pounds. We'll do this as we do all other important torques in three stages. Something like 30, 55, 85. Make sure you put a foot on your engine stand so it doesn't roll away when you're trying to do this. And as always, go from the center out. Remove screwdriver. Do the second torque run. Too excited on that one. Many annoying beeping noises later. Final torque. Ta -da. When I've torqued the main and rod fasteners, I give them a paint dot. Especially with this engine, because I don't have a cam yet, I'll be coming back to this in like a week or two, and I might forget what I've already done. Now that everything's torqued, give it a spin. That's actually way too nice. Now, due to the peculiarity of this deep skirt design, unlike the small block, uh, the other half of the main seal is in this cap. It requires these special end seals as well. I'll dab these ends with silicone and jam that thing in there, being very careful to keep these rail seals in place. Technique I tried this time on these end seals was having them a little rolled in underneath and then they sort of pressed into place as I went down. I think that's gonna work well. Because these cap bolts are recessed, they're actually special. That is a 12.38 head, so you're gonna have to find a socket for that that fits inside the hole, which can be a bit tricky. I think this Craftsman will do well. And the rear oil seal cap bolts get torqued to 30 foot-pounds. But don't just take my word for it. Ask a factory service manual or the internet. If everything came together right, this surface should be nice and straight. And these seals should be flush or just a hair over, but not up here. Also, take care not to get silicone on your crank while you're doing this. And now it's time to rotate this big heavy bastard and start on rods and pistons. One more thing, let's check the crank end play with this magnetic base setup. The end play spec is four thousandths to ten thousandths. I'm measuring about four. It's on the tight side, which is interesting. This is a stock replacement, 30 over, flat top piston. Cast, I believe. Note the pin is actually not centered. It's offset, just like factory. We didn't machine to get a zero deck or anything, so I am interested to see where this ends up. Note, it is a press fit pin. Again, same as factory, nothing special. Before I can slam these pistons in, they kind of need rings. And before I can install the rings, I need to check the clearances on those. First, square them in the bore, carefully and measure the end gap by finding a feeler gauge of an appropriate size. Mm -hmm. Ring end gap. Uh, the kind of end gap you want varies by the kind of engine you're building. This is a bone stock 440. It'll have a stock converter. It will do nothing special. It'll move around a big heavy station wagon and that's it. Because it's a lower performance engine, it can actually have a tighter ring gap for better sealing. In this case, the conventional wisdom says it should have something like an 18 thou gap on top and a 22 thou gap on bottom. Incidentally, these are flipped. I do come prepared, just in case I need to open those gaps. But some reading I've done indicates that having the gaps flipped like that, smaller on bottom, larger on top, is not at all uncommon with a stock type engine. And that's definitely what this is. So I think I'm gonna say it's fine and move on. If this were a performance engine, I would check every ring in every cylinder and make sure they're okay. But it's not, and I think I'm probably just gonna install them as they are. Here's what the next few minutes of my life look like. Installing rings. 
Now, the manufacturer of these rings actually recommends the use of an expander instead of spiraling them onto the piston, but I don't have an expander, so I'm gonna spiral them on anyway, delicately. Start one end in the groove and walk it around the piston. Watch for shavings and scrapings and make sure you don't deform the ring. They are kind of delicate. Also note, if you get confused here, the shiny coated ring is the top ring. Many piston rings have a marking like this to show you which way is up. Some don't, these top rings can go either way. Some people get very scientific with aiming the ring gaps. Uh, it's kind of pointless. They do move in there anyway. I just make sure to put one and two opposite of each other and aim the oil rails, you know, vaguely different directions. You really don't need to get too crazy with this. A big part of being successful at this, again, is having a process. But almost more than that, is knowing what you can get away with. Remember, check everything. Piston number eight made a weird rattling sound. We don't want that in there. I generally don't use a ring expander tool. I don't really like how far it opens the gap to slip the ring over the piston, but spiraling them on can deform them. So again, be careful with that. That's a full set of rings installed. Now it's time for rod bearings. But first, soup. Mmm, soup. Where was I? Oh yes, I believe I was over here. Cleaning rods and caps. Unlike main bearings, these rod bearings are the same top and bottom. There's definitely a crank journal protector in here somewhere. Oh yeah, there it is. Ask 10 engine builders what to use to lubricate your pistons and rings when you're installing them and you'll get 10 different answers. My choice, WD-40. Mmm, fish oil. Just a healthy coat, not a whole gallon. Don't forget to wipe out your bore first, like I almost did. Take stock of which way your rod's pointing. The tang should go towards the oil pan rail. Of course, if there's an arrow on your piston, that helps too. Easy. Journal protector installed. You could use those little plastic rubbery cappy thingies if you have them, but the length of 3 8 hose works great. It's easy to get in and out and it doubles as a bearing holderer. So you don't pop the bearing shell at the bottom when you tap the piston in. Good idea to have that. Make sure your crank pin is all the way down. Surprise, surprise, I forgot something. When you're installing your ring compressor, make sure you pick the piston up off the deck just that little bit to make sure you catch that bottom ring with it. This will go one of two ways. Either it'll go in in two hits or it'll bounce a ring out and fight me for an hour. Let's find out which. I guess it's the former. And now the rod cap goes in. Tang to tang, of course, with the rod. Tang faces the oil pan rail. And that little slot there is an oil squirter that's supposed to cool the piston skirt on the other side of the engine. Note, this rod bearing shell does not have the cutout for it. Lots of aftermarket bearings don't have that anymore. They don't really do much. And the rod nuts are installed, just snug for now. We'll turn this thing over and torque them all later. Very nice. Time to continue down the odd bank and install the rest of them. Note I now have the crank centered under number three. Also note the harmonic balancer bolt is installed because as you add pistons, it gets more and more difficult to turn it by hand. Note the ring compressor also gets a healthy spray of WD. Also note, you can't just release tension on this thing without using a tool in there. It'll explode. Note my tool of choice for sending the pistons home is a soft handled hammer. Also note, I'm not going to show doing everyone because that's how bad stuff happens. And because I said that, bad stuff happened anyway. And one of the oil control rings popped out. Yep. And we've got four pistons. Neat. Now I have to rotate this heavy chunk of scrap metal and do the other side. It was a joke, darling. You're not scrap metal. Check everything, part 17. I noticed there's actually a ding on this deck surface. It definitely wasn't me, and it probably wasn't my machinist, so that may have been there from the factory. It's right on the edge of the cylinder. It is round there, so it's not like it just happened. But, um, well, it's just inside of the firing on the head gasket. I think it's going to be fine. Huzzah! Let's torque some rods. This is where the paint dots really come into play, because you can't get all the rods at the same point in engine rotation. you got to turn it over at least once to make this happen. These get torqued to 45. Uh, I set the torque wrench for 45 and just kind of go back and forth a couple times. Make sure they're fully seated and happy. 
And there we have it. Fully torque bottom end and still turns very happily. So I'd say we're doing well so far. A quick note on oil clearances. I actually brought the proper tools to check them and I did that. And um, well, I'm kind of bad at stuff and I kind of got the measurements wrong. I never claimed to be good at stuff. I verified the machining on the crank was correct. I just kind of goofed when it came to using that interior telescoping gauge to checking the bearing clearances. Regardless, I decided it was fine and pressed on with assembly. I fully trust my machine shop and their ability to order the right bearings. And judging by how it rotates, everything's fine. If you're gonna do this at home and you wanna check your clearances, which I recommend you do, you should probably just use plastic gauge, which you can get at your local parts store. Well, I don't have a camshaft yet and I don't have a fancy oil pan gasket either. So for now, I'll wrap up what I can and, uh, you know, call it a night. So I went ahead and opened the oil pump up, checked it out, everything looks pretty good. I pre-lubricated it and installed that all-important O-ring. This is a high-volume oil pump from Melling. For this engine, a factory pump would have been just fine, but this is what we got. Of course, now I need to go clean the oil pump bolts. Yay! And the nice shiny clean oil pump bolts get evenly torqued to 35 foot-pounds. Oh, and the little fellas get 10. So cute. Now I need the oil pump pickup, which I left here in the dunk tank three months ago. I forgot, the old pickup's full of confetti. So I'm gonna get a new one of those two, which you should do anyway. Don't be cheap, it's a brand new engine. Snowmageddon might happen tomorrow and it could be a while until I touch this thing again. So you always wanna make sure your brand new engines that are sitting around open are covered up so they're safe. Today is tomorrow. And last night when I was laying awake in bed, I realized that the thrust reading I was getting into this thing was not sufficient. I kind of knew that yesterday, but I kept going anyway because, you know, video. So today, I pulled the cap for number three and checked it again. With the cap out, I've got five thou, which is good enough. With the cap in, I've got three. So I need to lightly sand those thrust surfaces with something like 1500 grit sandpaper on a very flat surface. And we'll see what that gets us. Thrust surface. Meat flat chunk of aluminum and 1500 grit sandpaper. It's not just good, it's pretty much good enough. Well, today is like two months worth of tomorrow since I started on the 440 project. Rather inconveniently, it's there and um, all this stuff is here. So uh, step one, I guess, is dig a hole. before is didn't have a cam kit so well there it is this is the comp cams 268h the specs on this are very similar to the factory 440 hp cam just a little peppier than what this engine would have had stock now to do this job properly we need to cover that thing and a ton of horrible greasy stuff and we have options here we've got your standard cruising model engine assembly lube lucas's assembly lube engine oil, and this, an ancient bottle of Chrysler camshaft lubricant, which is pretty cool. But since they supplied it for free, I guess we'll use comp stuff. As with every other part you install, make sure you give the cam a look over and a good cleaning. In this case, some kind of gross stuff on here, so gotta fix that. We've seen several camshafts recently with this weird surface finish. It looks porous, but it feels smooth, and I think it's fine. Let's say it's fine. Not only are there gross spots, there's also fuzz stuck to this thing before I ever touched it with a blue towel. So again, clean everything. There are many different lubricant options and there are several different ways to skin this cat. The way I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna put oil on the bearing surfaces because again, this thing will get pre-lubricated before it's ever started. 
and I'll put the comb lube on the lobes. Oh yeah, delicious. Don't be shy with this stuff. It should be a horrible bloodbath, and you'll know you did it right. Notice here I'm using the installation tool of choice. An old random head bolt. Gently guide this thing into the block. Try not to ding any of the bearings. If you do, you're gonna have a bad time. Moment of truth. Oh, come on. There. And look at that. Spins perfect. And that's why our favorite machinist gets paid the big bucks. Unlike the small block Chrysler engine, the big block Chrysler is interesting in that there's no cam retainer plate here. The only thing that keeps the cam from coming this way, the angle on the lifters. They kind of push it rearward. And then the gear rubs up against this surface and that's it. If you want to be fancy, this is your opportunity to degree the camshaft. I don't want to be fancy. And also, this is just a stock rebuild. Yeah, it's a slightly upgraded cam, but it hardly even counts. I'm going to install it dot to dot. I'm not going to advance or retard the cam either, even though this timing set gives me the option to do that. Truth be told, I don't own a degree wheel, and I have never degreed a camshaft. Not once. But I've also never built an all-out high-performance engine, so your mileage may vary on that one. It's often necessary to tap the crank gear into position. It is a tight press type fit here. Make sure you're using a brass drift or something else that's not gonna damage it. Tink. A word on timing marks. When setting up the chain, it's important to line up the dots, whether you're using this zero degree setup or whatever. Align your marks dot to dot. That position is 180 out. And if you install your distributor with the timing chain like this, you're gonna be 180 out and your engine's not gonna start. It's probably gonna backfire and you're gonna have a bad time. That position is TDC one. See what they mean when they say 180 out? Make sure when you install your distributor, your gears are in this position with the dots up. Chain is installed, center bolt gets Loctite and torqued to 35 foot-pounds. Don't forget to add some oil to the chain. They really like that. Before I get too excited and put the timing cover on, I'm going to just rotate this to 180 degrees now. Okay, time to install the timing cover, then turn the engine back over, do the pickup, and install the oil pan. But before I do any of that, I have to clean more bolts. Shiny new timing cover gasket installed. Note. I use dabs of silicone to hold it on here, but I do not cover it with that. We'll let the gasket be the gasket. You know, it's been quite a while since I cleaned all the tinware for this engine. In fact, it was long ago enough that I was wearing shorts then. <sighs> anyway, let's attach it to this engine with these fasteners, which look much better. Also note, I did take the liberty of installing the new front crank seal. I almost forgot. A couple notes here. Unlike some engines, you really don't need to center this on the harmonic balancer because it has dowel pins to center it precisely. A note about those dowel pins though. Sometimes people get excited and think they can just slam these timing covers back in after doing a cam change without loosening the oil pan. We well, can, but usually what happens is you ruin those dowel holes trying to get it back in position and then you create a horrible oil leak. Ask me how I learned that one. So if you ever have to do that, you know, put the timing cover in with the oil pan in place, I would probably loosen the front of it and take great care not to ruin your timing cover. Now we'll run these timing cover bolts down with a speed wrench. Important note, these bolts, for some reason, are two different sizes. 9 16 head on the bottom and half inch on the top. And remember, if you get too excited filming and leave the oil slinger out, because you didn't cover it in silicone, you can always just pull it right back off. It's fine. Everything's fine. Well, make sure the dish points out. Twice now I've seen them turned around backwards. 
Um, yeah, just don't do that. You may or may not have noticed this. We have some ideas for that. Don't worry about that for now. Okay, turn the engine back over. Now we'll install the pickup and the pan. Note, this needs to be done before lifters go in the engine. Just saying. I cleaned the new oil pickup and I did apply some thread sealer to the threads there. It's pipe thread, so it is self-sealing, but we definitely don't want aerated oil. That's bad. For the oil pan, we're using one of these modern one-piece plastic windage tray gasket deals with a fancy O-ring around the perimeter. For that to seal well, you really need perfectly straight rails on your oil pan. Unfortunately, those don't exist, but I've done the best I can here. Quite a bit of hammer work went into making that almost sort of straight flat dish. Dang it, I pointed in the camera again. Now someone's gonna tell me I'm trying to be vice grip garage. <sighs> Oops. Oil pickup to oil pan clearance is very important, and this is your one chance to get it right. Notice currently mine is slightly high centered on the pickup. It's just barely touching it. According to my calculations, that thick gasket is gonna make this work perfectly. If it doesn't work out that way for you, you can twist the pickup a little bit or even bend it slightly, carefully, and make it work. I can't really show you with the camera in one hand, but basically there's no rock with that gasket in place, so it's gonna be good. Now I just have to go clean oil pan bolts for the next half hour. Even though we're using the fancy plastic O-ring oil pan gasket, we're still gonna dab some silicone in these areas where the different components meet. Don't use too much, like I just did. What they don't tell you about a project like this, nice shiny engine rebuild or restoration, that sort of thing. It's not all glamour. A huge amount of your time will be spent cleaning fasteners. Yeah, they just don't tell you that. I mean, I'm telling you now, but that's not the point. Break out our friend the speed wrench again, and we do a bit of a crisscross pattern to set these oil pan bolts down. There is absolutely a proper torque spec for these bolts. It's something silly like 15 foot-pounds. I have had zero luck with that. If you tighten these bolts to 15 foot-pounds with a cork gasket, yeah, it's squishing out and you're ruining the pan, just like this one was. I do this by hand and by feel. And that's something that would be hard for me to explain to you. Especially with this gasket, it's got those metal rings in there to keep the thing from being squished too hard. So I'm just sort of tightening them evenly until they feel right. One more thing here. If you are using a cork oil pan gasket, I'll just spoil the surprise. You can look forward to retorquing that thing several times as that gasket squishes. Look forward to leaks and just general disappointment. I have no answers for how to make that situation better. All I can say is, good luck. Now before cylinder heads, I'm gonna go ahead and install the lifters. As with everything else, just because it's new, doesn't mean it's ready. Make sure you clean it. Lifter failure is something that's very common nowadays. I'm gonna say something that I hope doesn't get me in trouble. I've never had one yet. I have not had a new cam and lifter problem. <sighs> this will be the one that does, I guess. Uncle Tony has made several videos on this issue, and he says to check the crown on the lifters, which, well, I'm probably not going to do. They look normal to me, so I'm going to clean them and lubricate them and throw them in the engine. I used to soak my lifters in oil before installing them in the engine. Apparently that's totally unnecessary and not even recommended if you ask Hughes, so... Nowadays, I just lubricate them and throw them in there. Whatever you do, do not pump them up with oil. That's a bad idea. They will fill themselves with oil with no problem as soon as you crank and start your engine. It's very important that the lifters move freely in their bores. I've gone through with this lifter and checked all of them just to make sure there's no resistance issue there, and they're all good to go. For the lifter bodies, rotational area, I'm pre-lubricating these bores with engine oil. And for the faces, some more of the comp red goo. Oh, now that that's done, please get this stuff away from me. And there we go. Lifters installed. 
Now let's clean the deck surfaces with some brake clean on a rag. And, um, you know, try to keep the lint down. Yeah, there's all the stuff we don't want on our head sealing surface. We also don't want lint from the rag, and the blue towel does leave some behind, but it's pretty easily scrubbed off by hand. Whatever you do, don't use microfiber, and don't use red rags for this. One head gasket, two head gasket. Time to install these nice reworked 906 heads. They're beautiful, and yes, they're clean. One head on. I already cleaned these cylinder head bolts. In fact, that's what almost killed the bench grinder over there. That's weird, I'm missing two of them. Hmm, more on that later. When installing your cylinder heads, make sure the holes for the dowels are clean and they sit down all the way with no resistance. I might have learned that lesson the hard way once. All right, well, I've snugged the head bolts. I'm missing two, so I'm gonna have to figure that out. And I do also need to go back and look at reference pictures. There are a couple brackets that go on head bolts down here. Other than that, it's ready for torquing. It's also very late, so I'm gonna leave myself a note uh, about the head bolts not being done and call this a good natural stopping point. Hey, it looks like an engine, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, that ought to do it. I do also still need to clean and go over the valve gear and push rods. Yeah, we'll get back to this. It probably won't be another two months either. Here at Rocket, we do have a few engine parts, you know. Just a few. Had to go find reference photos from five months ago to figure out where these shields go. One more note on head bolts. These ones are all blind on this engine, so there's no water back there. On some engines, they do go into water jackets. I can't remember right offhand if any Chrysler big blocks are like that or not, but it's good practice to double check. You can use a push rod, drop it in there. If it just stops, it's blind. If it keeps going, uh, you need to put sealer on the threads. Just keep that in mind, it's something to check. All right, now it's finally time to torque the head bolts. Uh, the spec is 70, so we're gonna do that in three steps. 30, 50, 70. We'll start in the middle and spiral out. Torqued, and now I have one more, one more thought about head bolts. If you wanna be a humongous nerd, you can go find a chart that'll give every one of these a number, and you can do them in that order. But really, all that's happening there is they're telling you to tighten it from center out. So if you just do that, you really don't need to be that scientific about it. Okay, now it's finally time to go through these. You need to clean all of these components thoroughly and check everything. Make sure it's worth reinstalling. Mmm, nice refreshing soda. Push rods. Make sure they're straight. I'm just putting new ones in. I've been rolling these together in pairs to make sure they look good and I don't see any gaps. Obviously, if you have a nice flat table or piece of glass to roll them around on, well, you could do that, but I don't. Now I get to break this down and clean all of these components. My favorite. Make sure you take reference pictures and make sure the little and big spacers and the longer bolts get back where they belong. As well as, you know, the rocker arms in the right locations because they are not the same. And there we are. After way too much time, I've got one head's worth of valve gear, shiny and pretty. And there it is assembled. Note. I've done this several times, but uh, I still have to use an example to make sure it's right. I showed this trick in that coronet video, but uh, use a piece of mechanics wire to hold the push rods up there. Makes installing the rockers much easier. Okay, time to pre-lubricate valve tips and the push rods, as well as the rocker arms. Yeah, in here. Good lord. That poor donkey. Many hours of solvent tank work and wire brush and what have you, and this side's ready to assemble now. Little tip on these rocker arms, um, get them in the right order. Again, having the other side to compare to, that's great. But when they're paired up right, you'll have this nice triangle in the middle. And what it's doing is spreading that way because the push rods are tighter than the valve tips. So hopefully you can see that there. It's occurred to me someone in the back is probably asking if they need to keep these components in the order they were removed. Ah, uh, no, not really. We're dealing with production tolerances here and it's really not that important. The rocker arms assembled and lubricated, it's time to install them. Here's a demonstration of that rocker arm rolling technique. 
you hook them all on the valve springs like so, and they go right in place. Easy. It's very important on these tubes, set these bolts down evenly. You really don't want to warp or distort these things. Got one on lift here, so I am getting a good bit of resistance as I do this. Okay, important step here. Pull your wire out. Don't forget that. And to make sure these are all at 25 foot pounds. And again, jump back and forth. Try and get this thing torqued down evenly. And do not go over. That's a good way to squish the tube. Now it's time to run the harmonic balancer down. Now there are several ways to do this. One way is with the special installer tool. Then I don't have that today. Uh, another way is with a hammer and a wood block. I'm gonna use this extra long bolt. That's the right thread. And I've got a double washer there. Double washer, double washer. With oil in the middle for a bearing surface. I don't wanna turn the engine. I'm gonna start this gently with the impact. I'm not gonna bottom it out with the impact. Look at that. Beautiful. Very close. That might just be it. Now it's time to torque the harmonic balancer. So I started two flex plate bolts and I will put a pry bar right here to keep the engine from rotating. And the torque spec on this bolt. Yep. 135 foot pounds. There we go. Time to install the valley pan. It looks like this. Now, the instructions advise me to apply silicone to both sides here. I'm gonna do that on the back side only. If you silicone both sides, well, it kinda makes it a pain to take the intake off later. It's one of the great things about this design. They do say that these raised metal edges are supposed to be one use only, but in my experience, you can swap these intakes on and off with no problem. Silicone definitely needs to go here in these corners. Something like that. And I'm going to add a very light bead all along the wall, front and rear. I'll smear this so it's nice and thin in a moment here. Silicone. And ah, the middle's extra. Now obviously, you want to do a neat job here. Don't let a bunch of silicone end up in your ports. Make sure your port alignment is pretty good. Mine's actually off a little. There we go. If you do want to follow the letter on this, the manufacturer says put silicone on this side too, so you can go ahead and do that. but. I personally don't think it's necessary. Snug down the end rail bolts, again, watching the port alignment and the bolt holes as well. I think we're good here. And on goes the intake, which in this case is heavy. Install some intake bolts. Note, this is a cast iron manifold. Also note, all the factory brackets and things are going right back where they were. I took many reference pictures to try and get this right. Now it's time to torque the manifold, which I'll do in a couple steps to 40 foot pounds. A couple of these bolts will need to come out again later. This one gets a ground wire, this one gets an AC bracket, but for now, we'll just install them and torque them. As usual, we're kind of going to crisscross side to side, make sure it goes down evenly. After this, I'll go back and double check these. I'm sure they have a torque spec too, but it's not terribly important. It's always good practice to go back over what you've already done. See? As this intake settles, these bolts aren't tits back anymore. Intake torqued, holes in the top mask for painting and protection. Right exhaust manifold is on and torqued. Those fasteners go to 30 foot pounds. And again, all the brackets are where they go. I'd love to put the left one on, but first I need to extract this broken bolt. This is actually a replacement manifold we found in the hoard here at Rocket. The original was cracked there somewhere. Hopefully, you won't need to deal with this sort of thing on your engine. 
But if you do, here's a great technique to get broken bolts out. Make welder, bolt, zap. Build yourself up a little tower on there. So you can then grab vice grips. Let's see how we do. Sometimes it takes a couple tries. Sometimes it takes a few tries. The weld definitely stuck. It, uh, oh, where is it? There. Took off more of the bolt, so that's lovely. Heat is your friend. In fact, the main reason the welding trick works is because it puts a bunch of heat into the piece. Ah, let's see if the torch wants to help this one let go. Heat did it. Note the working back and forth technique. Oh, really? You know what they say. Fourth time's the charm. I could hit this with some spray at this point, but yeah, if it breaks again, then I'll just light that spray on fire. So I'll just take it nice and easy. And there you go. Just gotta clean this stuff up with a file and a wire brush or something. On it goes. No, oh, I will have to find another bolt, but that's fine. Funny story. I think this bolt broke because the factory didn't tap the hole deep enough. That's probably why it was so hard coming out anyway. It's fixed now. Cheap taps work. And there it is, mounted and torqued. Also set the valve covers in place with the gaskets. I'm gonna leave them unbolted until we finish pre-oiling so we can make absolutely sure there's good oil up to the top end. Now I'm moving on to this whole water pump housing thing. Well, water pump housing is bolted on. New pump's even in it. And I learned that this bolt does actually kind of hold torque. I mean, most of the hole is there. So we're gonna get some quick steel and fix that tomorrow. Hopefully we'll also have some oil and then uh, we can finish the pre-lube and this thing will be basically ready for paint. I can't even begin to tell you the number of hours I have into just cleaning bits for this operation. Well, actually I can, it's a lot. But the finished product is gonna be pretty sweet. And I'm very much looking forward to that. And of course, when it is ready, we'll be breaking it in on the Mopar no cart. Do you ever hear people complaining about reproduction parts not being very good? This is what they're talking about. <sighs> yeah. Good stuff. We're gonna fix this broken chunk of the block with this stuff. Cleaned it really well, shoved the bolt in there and added some anti-seize. Hopefully that works. Oh, that's not too bad. Like many operations here, it's kind of more art than science. Not bad, not bad. A little rough, but again, you know, Chrysler block. What do you know about digging around in the parts collection for the correct oil cap with the correct marking on it and then stripping the gasket off of this not correct one and putting that on there because the old one is bad and then sandblasting it so it's kind of sort of new looking and ready for paint. I'll tell you what I know, it took an hour. But there it is, ready to go. If you're just doing a basic rebuild on your 440, you probably won't have to spend 20 minutes cleaning and prepping the sparkle wire clips for paint. And that's fine, but that's the level of job we're going for here. Oh yeah, beautiful. Valve cover bolts, way too nice. All right, got five fresh quarts of Joe Gibbs driven breaking 1550 in there. Time to pre-lube this thing. Note, I'm gonna try and get oil up to the top end, so let's put out some bibs. Drill, priming tool, in reverse, because big block. Make sure it's in the pump. You should hear right away when it starts making pressure. We might need a better trail. Now, as you can hear, it picked up oil, it made pressure, and it's circulating through the engine. But we don't have any oil up here at the top end yet. That's because it has to go through a hole drilled in the cam, and it only does that at two angles. One angle for that side, one angle for that side. So let's turn the engine over twice, see what happens. So, the trick here is to slowly turn the engine 
while running the drill. It's a bit of a dance. Oh, that was easy. The hole for the left bank lined up right away. Made a big old mess. Perfect. Right bank is still dry, so we'll keep going. Oh, a few bubbles. And there's oil. Beautiful. Sometimes the goals of doing a good build on an engine and doing a perfectly clean and restoration worthy job on an engine uh, don't really cooperate. One of the last things I need for the 440 is a fuel pump push rod because that got lost in translation. There's gotta be one here somewhere, but I don't know where. The sheer volume of Mopar parts and hardware here at Rocket is truly amazing. And it's surprising and somewhat annoying. I can't find the one little thing I need. Man, this thing cleaned up good. Surprise! It's got a stripe! Way too neat. Hey, I found my fuel pump push rod. I'm sure you won't mind too much. Well, it's kind of gross, but it's not mushroomed on the end, which is a common problem with these. Push rod is in, as is the pipe plug. I also took the liberty of installing a set of painting spark plugs. The valve covers are installed and, well, torqued for now. I'll definitely have to go over those again. It's looking pretty good. Before paint, it'll definitely get the ground wire, which goes right there. Those were painted at the factory on the engine. One of the last things I need to do here, install the oil pump drive intermediate shaft, which also has the cam drive gear on it. That might be right. I believe the line on that goes front to back when it's in the correct position. Have to go verify that. If it is wrong, let's take the big flathead screwdriver and spin it uh, yeah, one direction or another. It'll back itself out of there. Then you just re-aim it, stab it again. Yeah. Check the diagram, drop the distributor in, which I actually restored a few months ago. I do still need to put the points and things back in there. Anyway, according to the diagram, number one is right here by the clip, so I think we're good. I left future Jamie some important notes here. And there we are, a finished 440, ready to be painted and broken in. As you can probably tell, uh, I've got a lot of time into this engine. If you just want to rebuild your 440, you probably don't need to clean and sandblast every little piece. Hopefully you enjoyed this and maybe you learned something. It took a long time to film, so, well, we can only hope. Next time you see this engine, it'll probably have some paint splashed on it and we'll be putting it on the Mopar no cart for a break-in. Until then, thanks for watching. And remember, don't forget to bring your towel.